everybody, and welcome to the Butler Scholars Spotlight reading and discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I know there's a lot going on this weekend. Um, I am Kay Tempest Bradford, and I am the vice chair of the steering committee for the Carl Brandon Society, which is sponsoring this event. Uh, and the Carl Brandon Society is an organization that is dedicated to um, basically promoting and bringing more uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color into speculative fiction, um, supporting our writers, supporting our fans um, in various ways. And one of the ways that we do this, um, and one of the reasons why this is part of the Celebrating Octavia fundraiser, is uh, we have the Octavia E. Butler Memorial Scholarship Fund, which we started after Octavia passed in 2006, I believe. Um, and uh, it was a way to continue what Octavia was already doing, which was supporting the next generations of writers of color coming into this genre uh, and giving them the opportunities that Octavia was given, which was to attend the Clarion workshop. She attended um, Clarion, and but she was also a huge supporter of Clarion West, uh, which is, you know, same, same kind of deal, different city. So with us today, we have four of the recipients of that scholarship, um, all really amazing writers who you're all gonna meet. Um, they're gonna talk about their time at either Clarion or Clarion West, um, and they're gonna talk about the impact Clarion or the scholarship had on them, and then they're gonna read to you from their fabulous works. So I'm gonna slide out of the way here in a minute um, so that we can let our readers go, but just so you know, if we have time, towards the end of uh, the readings for questions. If you will put your questions at that time in the YouTube chat, because there's somebody monitoring that YouTube chat uh, for questions at that time. But in, in the meantime, you guys can just chat away. All right, so the order of our readers today, uh, we're gonna have Christopher Caldwell, Shweta Narayan, Dennis Staples, and then Kai Ashanti Wilson. All right, so starting with Christopher, take it away. Hello, um, I'm Christopher Caldwell. I am coming to you from sunny, well, rainy Glasgow um, in the evening. And I attended Clarion West in 2007. And um, I actually ended up being one of the first two recipients of the scholarship. Uh, and I attended Clarion West in 2007 because a few years before I'd read Blood Children, uh, um, um, Blood Child, sorry. Um, and in one of Octavia's essays, she talks about uh, Clarion being a formative experience for her. And she had taught at Clarion West, I think in 2005, and I didn't get it together to apply then. And then obviously in 2006, she passed away. And so I told myself the next year, I definitely was going to apply. And at that point, I didn't know anything about the scholarship or how I was going to fund it or what was going to happen, but I was going to apply. So I looked at both workshops and I decided that year I wanted to apply to Clarion West because one of the instructors was Samuel Delaney, who was also Octavia's instructor and obviously is a huge formative influence in science fiction and black and queer as I'm black and queer. And it seemed like a good match. And I applied and I was accepted, which was a fantastic thrill because really I hadn't been doing anything with my writing at this point. Um, and then I found out that I was the recipient that year of the Octavia Butler Scholarship. So it was a huge honor for me. It also was kind of a huge pressure because um, I made myself feel like I needed to live up to with these titans of uh, the industry. Um, fortunately, I've gotten over it since then, but um, the experience for me was really great. I found a supportive community of writers. I got to meet some really amazing people. I got some feedback from um, people that I've looked up to from years. And um, I learned a lot about myself, which I think is the most important thing in the workshop. Um, like there's craft stuff you can learn anywhere. Um, and like the connections you can also make other places, but just having that time to work on my own writing and my own self for six weeks really kind of opened my mind to different things I could do and built my confidence in a way that I really needed. So um, I don't, 
think the workshop is necessarily for everyone and you certainly don't need to go to the workshop to be successful in um, science fiction or fantasy or horror. But for me, it was a great experience overall. And I would really like um, for more Butler scholars to go because I think um, increasing the number of uh, black indigenous people of color in, in the kind of settings that these take place in is a benefit for everybody. Um, okay, uh, that's my experience. Uh, I'm going to be reading from a story called Can't Stow Draw Out the Leviathan. Uh, there'll be an excerpt from that. It, this story first appeared in Uncanny Issue 33, uh, 2019. I think it was uh, May, June issue. And it also is appearing this year in the Best of British Fantasy. Okay. <clears throat> John Wood boarded the Graciella ahead of the crew. He carried a sea chest on his shoulder and a satchel slung low on his hip were his tools and the three things most precious to him. A lock of his grandmother's hair, a shaving from the first cabinet he's built as a boy, and his freedom papers. No light but the moon, but John could walk the length of the Graciela's decks, eyes closed and barefoot without placing a wrong step. She was named for the daughter of two men who held her title, and at sea she belonged to the captain but John reflected that she was his as much as anyone's. His hands had shaped, and, shaped her and healed her, cosseted her, kept her afloat. He ducked down below decks. In the dark, he made his way midship to a space he and the cooper shared. The smell of sawdust and resin was a comfort. A few strikes of a flint and the lantern overhanging his workplace was a light. John set about arranging his tools. The work here was sweet. He ran his hands over words he had carved on the underside of the vice bench. I hereby manumit and set free John Wood. He may go wheresoever he pleases. The sixth night out from Nantucket, John woke to find William Harker looming over him in the darkness. John sat bolt upright in his hammock. William put a calloused finger to John's lips. William's voice was silky. I've been thinking it's been a mighty long time since I've been ashore. Man can develop a thirst. John groaned, half an anticipated pleasure, half an exhaustion. <sighs> Not even a week yet. Ain't your winching last you a fortnight? William bent close to his ear. John could smell salt, armpits, ass. William's breath was hot on his cheek. Taint winches I'm after. I was hoping the ship's carpenter might lend us some wood. John put one big scarred hand on, William put one big scarred hand on John's crotch. John felt himself stir in response. Capital make you kiss his daughter if I'm too ill rested to swing my hammer come daybreak. William put his other hand on John's neck. My harpoon will be all the keener for it and I can give you practice with your hammer. John sighed. Best get on with it. It's summer and the night's nowhere near long enough. He slid out of his hammock and led the big harpooner by the wrist from steerage towards the four tween decks. John shoved William against the bulkhead and fumbled with his breeches. For all his talk of rest, John was every bit as eager. In the darkness, he traced William's form with deft, curious hands. The body was familiar, the taut belly, the ropey scar high on one hip. He found William's mouth with his own, hungry and biting. They rocked as the ship rocked. John felt the crest of a wave, and in its deep trough, heard William cry out. Warm, sticky wetness splashed against his thigh. Slick and sweaty, the two men clung to each other. William whispered, I'll make you pretty baubles from the bone of the next whale I kill. I'll spin my lay to bring you spices and silk. I'll... Light pierced their quiet darkness. John saw the earnestness in William's eyes before William shoved him away and pulled up his breeches slipping back the way he came. John shaded his eyes. Pip, one of the cabin boys, walked past, wide-eyed towards the forecastle, with a stinking little lantern and a beaten tin cup. If he took any notice of John near naked and smelling of sweat and spunk, no sign of it shone on his dark, intense face. John laced up his breeches and followed after. Hoy there, Pip, the boy spooked. Hoy, sir. John laughed. Ain't no one ever called me, sir. And you ain't about to start. Name's John, or John Wood, if you have to keep formal. Bought my own freedom, and I won't let me give you yours. The boy gave him an owlish look. Hoy, John Wood. Never bought my freedom. 
Suppose I might have stolen it. John clapped Pip on the back. He pointed at his chin with a tin cup. What's that, boy? Cornmeal. Pip pinched his lips together. I ain't steal it. Cookie gave it me. Knob and hearted old skinflint like Cookie gave you half a near cup of it? You must got more charm than I know. The boy cradled the cup close to his narrow chest. His eyes were wide. La Seren knows ways to soften the hearts of men. John ruffled the boy's hair, as coarse and kinky as his own. What you doing with that this time of night? Watch. John watched in the flickering lamplight as the boy wet a finger with his tongue and traced with precision a little boat on the deck. Pip finished his drawing by writing a word strange to John. Imamu. John said, I learnt my letter as soon as I got my manumission papers, but what's that word for? Pip said, protection. John laughed. I don't know about that. Ain't no charm against the captain if he finds you asleep on the first watch. Get to bed, boy. Pip blew out the lantern. Two more days out in early morning, John was dumping wood shavings into the cold furnaces of the triworks when he heard a foremast hand's thin voice cry from the hoops. She blows! There she blows! A cachalot! The captain roared. A sperm whale, I! Where, boy? Be quick! She alone? Lured, Captain. One spray. No more in a league out. To the boats, boys! The captain cracked a rare smile. Mr. Wood, you keep my ship in order. John looked among the bodies scrambling over the deck for the other ship keepers. Cookie, the cooper, the blacksmith, and the steward. He saw they were all awake and above deck. Cabin, sir, all's ready for your return. The captain beckoned at the big Hanukkah harpooner known Koafa, whom everyone called Gospel. With measured speed, they headed to the first whale boat, four crewmen in tow. William ran to the third boat, whale boat swinging from its davit. His boatkeeper, the portly second mate, closed on the lean blonde harpooner's heels. William looked back at John once and shouted, I've not forgotten me words to you. The captain's boat launched first and the boat with William soon splashed down after. John heard the captain cry out, Take care, you louts! Any of you galley this whale and she sounds, I'll strike you with nine lashes. Four whaleboats set out lured after the whale. John stood for a moment at the railing midship, watching them row, each boat keeper urging their crew on in faster and low growls. Cookie stood at John's shoulder. He spat a thick gob of phlegm over the side. He sucked at his gums. Whale brains the night instead of salt horse. The sun was high when John first heard the crew again. Echoing over the waters, rough voices sang obscenely about the ladies of Cuba before the first of the whaleboats came into view. Towed behind them, the fluke was the carcass towed behind them by the fluke was the carcass of a sperm whale, nearly half as long as the Graciella herself. John yelled for Pip to attend the returning crew. The ship pitched and listed as they lashed the massive beast starboard for the cutting in. The crew were wet and boisterous, although to John's eyes, tired and the worse for wear. William's whaleboat was the first. The second mate's face was red. Grog, he shouted. Grog for the harpooner. Pip ran over with a tin cup full of drink slopping over the edges. William took it from him with both hands and drained it in a single pull. He looked over at John. The old bull was meaner than my granny but I keep my promises. The captain supported one of the rowers around the shoulder. John ran to help. Ethan, his name was. John knew him to be a serious, quiet boy from Pennsylvania. His thin, white arm was bent at a ruinous angle. He slumped into John's arms, his face gray. John thought Ethan would, need, would have need of his saw. The boy whimpered. John looked to the captain. He well? Struck by the fluke of a whale. Plenty of grog and full barrels of parmacetti will help him forget, I reckon. Time he comes to collect his lay, he'll be smiles again. John half carried the boy down into the darkness of the forecastle. He lifted him onto his hammock, the boy yelping and shuddering. Ethan's eyes were large and tearful, but John knew he was needed on deck to erect the cutting stage. He stroked the boy's hand. I'll send the steward to come look after you. The sun was low to water when John, stinking and calloused, hammered the last plank of the cutting stage into place. The hand's voice is hoarse with the hours of filthy shanties, gospel abstaining. The whale was held fast to the Graciella with great chains. 
John remembered the injured boy, but knew Captain would see pulling an able worker away to tend to Ethan as coddling. Every hand was turned into cutting in the whale. The harpooners peeled its skin and spiraling strip known as those blankets with long handled cut in spades. Each blanket piece was so heavy it took John and six others to haul it up. Men already sore and tired with rowing and killing chopped those pieces into smaller sections, yet again to be minced into paper thin slices known as Bible leaves. William was back in the water with a monkey rope tied around his waist, packing up buckets full of spermaceti to the two cabin boys, who ran the pearl colored waxy substance over to barrels which with full were hammered shut and sealed under the eye of the cooper. The, dead, the deck was red and slick with blood. On one of his last passes, Pip slipped in the gore and fell on his back. John tossed a piece of horse blubber to the back blacksmith and hurried over to the boy. Pip's eyes fluttered shut as milk-fragrant spermaceti from his bucket pooled around his narrow frame. John lifted the boy up and staggered against sudden weight. In an instant, Pip felt heavier than one of the blanket pieces. He kneeled under the tremendous burden. Pip's eyes snapped open. The boy's expression was hard and made him look far older than his 14 years. His voice was like thunder. John Wood, you know me not, but I know you. Your kin called to me for safe passage across my waters. John groaned, struggling to keep the boy upright. Pip, this ain't sensible. You struck your head. The boy's look was pitying. Pip, no. I am the storm and the wind hard behind it. I am the wave and the darkness below. I, the white foam and the shifting sea sand. Do you know me, John Wood? John whispered. Agwe. The blood remembers. Destruction follows your present course. You have until the moon waxes full and wanes again. Pip shut his eyes. John felt weight banished from the boy. The first mate, a tough, wiry man with a parsimonious mouth and thinning, sandy hair, stood over them. You niggers pick a fine time for resting. Work to be done, and that spill parmacetti will come out of your legs, so I swear. Pip squealed. Sir, it ain't the carpenter's fault. Sir, Mr. Wood was just helping me on account I'm so clumsy. That's so. You'll pay double penalty, then. John stared hard at the deck so as not to give the first mate a reason to call him out for insolence. Sir, now Pip's up and about. If I have your leave, I'm needed elsewhere. First mate scowled. What are you looking po face for? Back to work! That night, the fires in the triworks burned hot. Foul smoke, black as ink, curled up and blotted out the stars. The crew pitched Bible leaks into the tripods for rendering. The cutting in had slowed after sunset, and John had turned his hand to the captain's whaleboat, which had seen some damage from the flailing whale. It needed bailing out with a piggin on the way back, but John assessed the boat as being in fine condition, all things considered. He was sanding out a new board to replace one that had been cracked in the hunt, when a shadow distinct from the roiling clouds of smoke fell across him. Without looking up, he said, William, your mama was no glass blower. William's smile seemed to beam in the lantern light. He was wrapped in a moth-eaten old bear hide and held out two cups of grog. Looks like thirsty work there. John accepted one of the cups. He took a deep pull, relishing the burn down his throat. He gazed up at William, shivering cold, bedraggled, ridiculous in that bear hide, reeking of stale blood, salt, and sweat. Beautiful, he said. You stink. You ain't think to splash some of that ocean water on you whilst you was splashing around with that big fish? William smiled and squatted next to John. That whole time I was fighting that mean old bastard, thinking what you'd say to me when I came back with a mouthful of teeth to carve into something for you kept me going. He rested his hand on John's shoulder. Careful, you'll get old gospel to come over and gives a sermon about the evils of sodomy. And I don't know about you, but I prefer my sin and quiet, John said. Be days before a whale this size is barreled and tucked away unless the sharks find it first. We won't have any idle hands for the devil's tools, I reckon. John sweated William's hand off his shoulder. The devil? You think I'm old scratch? You are a mighty temptation. William's voice turned serious. That little Negro cabin boy. What's happened to him? There's some whispers that he's touched. He fell. That's all. Ain't none of you hoodoo feeling whaler men never fell? 
William pulled his hand, William pulled John's hand to his mouth and kissed his knuckles. I know you're fond of him. I, I wanted to beware if things go sour. A great big whale out there in less than a fortnight's time and you are all muttering about things going sour? John laughed, but thought of the word destruction and all his mirth drained away. Okay, uh, that's my excerpt. You can read the rest of it at Uncanny or later in um, uh, Best of British Fantasy. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Christopher. That was wonderful. Yay! We don't have like a live audience, so I have to be the one clapping. <laughs> All right, so next up is uh, Shweta. Um, so yeah, introduce yourself and talk about your time uh, at Clarion or Clarion West. I can't remember which one you went to. Um, and uh, read for us. Hi, I'm Shweta Narayan. I'm I'm a non-binary person from India, and I went to Clarion. I was one of the inaugural Butler scholars, just like Christopher, back in 2007. Uh, though at the time, I just thought I was bad at being a woman. I want to like echo absolutely everything Christopher said, but uh, I, I had a different take on this. I haven't produced or sold much in a while. Nothing to do with the Butler scholarship or Clarion. They were really a good for me. But my adrenal glands conked out from about 2008 to 2014. And super long story short, my brain is often mush. And I wasn't exactly a fast writer even before that. So I might go over time with some of my preamble because I've got stuff to say, but I'll be reading some poetry and it runs less than 10 minutes. So I think it'll work out. My biggest challenge with everything I write is making it comprehensible, which I think just happens when you write perspectives and cultural settings your audience isn't familiar with. So I wanna talk a little bit about clarity. Timmy Duchamp's Wiscon guest of honor speech influence my, influences my thinking here a lot. The essays on her website, The Matter of Tongues. What I'm working on now, as health allows, is a piece called Bindings, almost novella length, it got rejected a couple times, then a rewrite request that I couldn't do. And now it's got a rewrite request that I can do and I feel improves it. It's in my clock bunk setting where mechanical people have existed in what's now Southern India since antiquity. Features this immortal-ish clockwork bird who's lodged in my brain and won't leave. This is story number seven now. I think because she exists on the edges. She's clockwork, she doesn't present human. She doesn't fit into history or any actual historical culture, though she is riffing off ancient Tamil literature. Her form, shape, presentation is fluid, and it all lets me get at stuff in my own head. Now, bindings are set in the 1660s, when several European powers were fighting over the subcontinent, in a part of Maharashtra under Portuguese control at the time. And my viewpoint character is a non-binary Sicilian teen at a time when many people still thought in terms of demonic possession rather than more modern forms of transphobia. It's a lot to get across. 1660s humans are weirder than the clockwork bird. So after I don't even wanna know how many drafts, the main issue on this rewrite is still clarity. So what's clarity mean? Clear to whom with how much work on the author's part versus the readers and who gets to be understood and who's forever explaining. Clarion made me professionally publishable. Clarion Critz turned one of my submission stories into my first pro sale and a Nebula nominee, both because of writing advice and because of support from some of the instructors, especially Delia Sherman. I'm not the only multiply marginalized writer with Adelia Sherman story, she's amazing. The most important bit of advice for me personally from Delia and Ellen Kushner is that own voices writing can be about structure as well as content. I'd been told my stories are so fragmented, they don't make sense, where's my plot? Why am I switching viewpoints again? Why don't I write more clearly? They help me understand that my plots are fragmented because my identity and experience is fragmented. 
And that means even a quite progressive market might tell me that what I sent them isn't a story at all. Coming back to Timmy Duchamp, she said, instead of clarity, think about accessibility, which depends on the perspective of the reader as well as the writer and the overlap between them and acknowledges that this isn't objective or about quality. It also lets us ask how accessible do we want to make a piece to normally cis, het, middle-class, white, American Anglophones. With this framing, that's an artistic choice with, with professional consequences. And what I'm trying to do with bindings now and why I feel good about the current rewrite is I'm trying to balance accessibility with keeping and clarifying my rather alien human perspective. Another famously great thing about Clarion is the connections you make in the industry advice, but that aspect wasn't as great for me. For one thing, we were told to take care not to be difficult and to be nice because publishing is small and people talk, and that is important, but be nice to who was left implicit. So then during Race Fail 2009, I was gaslit and used by some white people whose authority I respected. And as a direct result, I messed up a lot and I hurt other BIPOC. I wish I'd been more difficult to the people in power then. What I learned at Clarion made that harder, though I hope that's changed since 2007. Then in 2010, when Elizabeth Moon suggested that Muslims should assimilate to white Christian America, I spoke out against that. I published an essay on my own experiences with assimilation and coming to terms with it. One of my white Clarion classmates came into my comments with all the racism, complete with, I have black family, so I can't be racist. Some other white classmates who I thought were good friends either tried to defend him or ghosted me over it. So I do wish I'd learned more caution and critical thinking about the field, but you know, even though I've largely fallen off the face of the earth, my black indigenous pe people of color classmates have been in touch, check in on me and I hurt them. And more of us means more of that kind of community as well as more excellent voices. For one example, Kai's work is breathtaking. You're in for a treat. And I'm looking forward to getting well enough to read more. So back to this poetry I'm reading. I've got a story in Lightspeed Magazine, World of the Three. It's set in the ancient Tamil kingdoms, what's now South India. They were in Sri Lanka too, but I don't know that history. It's a strange setting, which I'm gonna explain for accessibility. There's a lot of literary sources for Tamil culture around somewhere between the third century BCE and the third century CE but not a lot of archeological data. So we know like tax rates in a city without knowing where the city was. And a lot of what we know about the culture comes from this whole genre of love poetry where a given mood or aspect of relationships is tightly linked to a specific landscape with its own plants, animals, people, and professions, and also its specific season and time of day. I've only read these in translation because I can barely read even modern Tamil. Growing up, I didn't even know we had an old poetic tradition. And it's so rooted in that landscape when I'm not. And it's heteronormative, cisnormative, gender normative. And some non-resident Indians romanticize it with like Atlantis truth levels of what? So there's all of that stuff, but while I can't not read it critically and I can't forget that it's not exactly mine, I kind of love it. So complicated feels on it. One of my favorite poetic landscapes is called Nado, which means the blue water lily. It focuses on the seashore and the mood it goes with is waiting, longing, separation. Imagine the heroine waiting by the sea, scanning the horizon for her lover's ship. It's really extra. I'll be reading my responses to the Nadal poetic landscape now. The first poem I'm reading um, was published in Disabled People Destroy Fantasy, which was Uncanny Magazine, I think issue 30, which was September, October last year, but that doesn't quite match what Christopher said, so one of us is right anyway. And it's called Nadal from Abroad. 
Even your brine, fish stink, overflowing sky's nets to lodge behind this tongue. Even then, Karna, I'm flotsam, distant, half under, sure only of old air burning this throat and the next shredding gulp for boundary. Cranes in water lilies, I know, but not whose or where or whether they knew you. If there was ever a you waiting in that landscape sealed away in story as all land is. Does it matter where knotted winds tossed me to build sand house translations from disjoint bits of what might have once been you? What seashore to ungainly muggerum, half trunk, half scale, all drowning? What's poetry that won't even let my net caught betweens into your words? Only this, an ache of air and memory, the lie in which something is mine. So the second one I'm gonna read is called Breaker and it's unpublished or I guess it's being published right now, right here. If this body could drift unclenching, would whitened waves throw it back? Or would it find their landless heartbeat balance? If warm brine could wash the breath rock out between abraded ribs, would it tumble in slowing time through seaweed and thickening water, scrubbing smooth each snagging edge to fall as one of a thousand pebbles to the ghost deck of one of the thousand sunken ships that line a coast you call my home? Would it settle? as I can't by a long dead coin or skull and say, someone clings dissolving to us both who can reach neither. So this last one, it's forthcoming in the anthology Climbing Lightly Through Forests, edited by R.B. Lemberg and Lisa M. Bradley, which is an anthology of responses to Le Guin's work, Le Guin's work. And though I took my title from The Dispossessed, this is mostly a response to Left Hand of Darkness, which I've loved since I was a teen. But the formatting on this one's a bit complicated. And by that, I mean, I have different fonts and parentheses and line stuff. So we'll see how it works. An idea of boundary, what the rains left, light unbalanced, unshadowed, Human male among human beings who were flinch from the first slur to fall guard down on Genley's neuters, his landlady, a voluble man, new lunar changelings, deviants, her. I've reached wordless from sky shore, tiptoe pulling her worlds from their high shelf. I've swayed, searching cold, unbalanced for ways in, wall tops she'd never write, climb, slip, breathless in space cold air, search both ways for belonging, fall, climb, scabs torn, slip to another world, wall, always neuter, climb. How do we shed calluses grown round her sharp edges, still break skin her new Flinch, slashed in ice light after image, whose betrayal was of a friend. All I had, her marginal world on the edge, her lunar alien, my person, sprawled on that border breathless, chest half shut away, misgendered even then, my people die. All I had, two biting edges weathered for the unwritten perch. Can I break orbit from eyesight unhumaning to fall, speak, soft edged with white winged crows into dusk, suckles sky cow thunder scatter on warm rain reach through mute unbelonging for a land shore of pandan walls eaten by river silt. What beloved aliens would I find? How did we misplace a city? What the rains left Unbalance, ice bright, mute, no. Slipping through Genley's binary gaze and hers, learning to shed, rewrite, 
dance on star grit salt, ungendered, many headed outside words to leave scale prints, edge blurred launch prints, shadowed, tentative, loyal for your flight. That's me. Great. That was so beautiful. Thank you. And also I want to thank you for for basically everything that, that you said before the beautiful poetry, because plus one, like I just I co-sign all of that and big hearts to you. Awesome. Okay, so next we have Dennis Staples. Dennis, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I was part of the Clarion class of uh, 2018. And uh, right, right before that, I graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, with a uh, Master of Fine Arts in Fiction. And uh, what I found in both of these workshops um, were a lot of really good friends and family. That's, that's what the, the scholarship and my, uh, my workshop uh, in Santa Fe both meant to me was um, finding finding communities of writers uh, through a lot of common ground, uh, especially in the um, the MFA. It, there were uh, Native Americans and Indigenous people from all across the country uh, who uh, I felt I, I had a lot of a lot of universal experiences with, and th there was a connection there that. Um, I felt was pretty strong, but at the same time, these were places that uh, I'd never been to, um, you know, the Southwest reservations, Northwest. Uh, these were, these are places that they all come with their own unique uh, cultures and climates and ways of life that weren't as, um, th there were nothing like my experience as a Northern Minnesota and Ojibwe. Uh, so um, similarly, when I went to Clarion, uh, the, uh, our class, I believe, had m many, many people from uh, all walks of life. But uh, what was notable is that there weren't many Seattle residents. There are people from uh, just a wide array of walks of life. And it was great to be a part of the workshop and I guess really up my game on really reading these short stories. Uh, it was a lot of exhausting work, but rewarding work at the same time to just read for hours and hours a day, marking up papers, um, but also just enjoying these voices that uh, you don't really get the chance to hear when you live in just a, a rural area for your whole life. Um, so what I wanted to read today was a chapter from my novel, This Town Sleeps. It's called Plastique Shaman. Uh, it's, it's about the mid-range, but lately I've been thinking about it because a lot of the um, conversation on the protests uh, has had to do with the um, statues and sacred iconography that, and instantly my mind went to this chapter. I hope you guys enjoy it. Oh, and then just a little bit of context of the story. Uh, my main character, Marion, is investigating or taking an interest in a uh, uh, spiritual apparition in the form of a dog, and he doesn't quite know why it is um, why it is targeting or following him. So he he seeks the advice of a um, of a, another person on another reservation. Maybe you need a name. The morning does not bring my mother back. Ami's eyes are dark red and flickering like a weathered film strip. He hasn't had a cup of coffee in years. Even the idea of caffeine addiction makes him uncomfortable. But the smell of the fresh pot woke me up. I slept easily, unlike him. I've made it, far, uh, made it this far without one, I say. Think of how much his head, pops down, his head bobs down and shoots back up, almost rhythmically, as he tries to stay awake. Does my mother have a name? Ouija Wagen, my life partner, Ani says. That's not a name. Well, fine, she refused a name too. What the hell made you Lafourniers so stubborn? When I was in middle school Ojibwe class, I first learned the concept of having an Indian name or spirit name. 
the phrase we had to use for our English name actually translates to pretend to be called. Marion Lafournier indigenous cause. I pretend to be called Marion Lafournier. But I've nev never had the feeling that I was not Marion. I've hated my name before, sure. Going through middle school with the nickname Marianne the Four Eyes wasn't the best, especially when I always tried to hide my sexuality, but still face some rumors anyway. Indians aren't complete unless they have a traditional name, my Ojibwe teacher told us in middle school. I have two given to me by an elder, one I can share and one I keep to myself. Ani insists that I should receive my name, that it'll stop this haunting or whatever is going on with me. If what Ani says about dead, dead bodies is true and it's connected to the dog in Caden Kellier's grave, I wonder now if there's some part of Caden's spirit living with me all this time. I take out a cigarette, Marlboro Red, and toss it to him. Okay, you can name me. He catches the cigarette on the filter between his index and middle fingertips, careful not to let the tobacco fall. That's not how you gift a Sema. Sorry. I try to take the cigarette back, but he withholds it. But... I'll accept it. I can't actually give you a name, but I can take you to someone who can. I resist the urge to roll my eyes and instead ask him if he wants me to cook him something for breakfast. The chair legs scrape across the kitchen floor and his body wilts down, asleep. I finish my coffee and then drag him to the couch. Outside, I let the dogs out of their kennel and they take to the yard as if it was new to them again. Unlike Basil at the park, none of them seem interested in the place where the revenant was. The two youngest mutts run off to, into the nearby woods. The pit bull paws at the roots of a tree with a German shepherd circling and Kuba plops down by my feet on the porch. My phone still has no text or call from my mother. Ani's phone is similarly silent. His is a cheap flip phone with no service other than calls. So there's no real privacy for me to break by checking it. Turkey Feather is a much quieter reservation than Langy Lake. The biggest town here is no bigger than Gishik, and they have only one casino instead of three. Aside from the padding steps and the panting of the dogs, there is not much noise out here. The yard around me is spotless. The kitchen inside spotless, the garden free of dandelions or other pests. I can't even try to be a good son while I wait, unless I learn how to finish the sweat lodge that Ani is building in the backyard. Just for the hell of it, I open up my dating app. There isn't much service out here, but the app can be accessed through Wi-Fi. There's no one within 10 miles and the closest handful of profiles have no pictures. I scroll down and see Shannon's profile. It now has a name, just his initials. He still doesn't have a picture, but he's brave enough for initials. I'd like to say I don't watch his profile for patterns, but I do. He loves Friday nights and early, early Sunday mornings for fucking. He goes offline after every meeting of ours. He's the only profile I have marked in my favorites. Shannon still has no descriptions, except for the relationship status that is now set to dating. And he hasn't been online for a full day. I have to assume he means he is dating me, but that's too much to hope for for a closet case. At the south, at the south end of this, res this reservation, there is a giant turkey statue with a stone bench at its talons. Though the largest turkey farm is white owned, the abundance of these birds gave this reservation the honorable and dignified name Turkey Feather. I follow Ani's truck through Miguan, past the statue and further into the reservation. On this side, the woods have faded away and now there is only open pasture and gray cages filled with turkeys, the ground more shit than soil. Ani's medicine guy lives out here. At first he was insistent we drive with only one car, but I don't like being anywhere I can't get away from on my own time. So with a rare show of some contempt, Ani let me drive myself. While driving around the state and a few others years ago, I noticed that there is always that house, that one house in every county background. It's surrounded by fields, white, two-story with a long driveway and a station wagon out front. A perfect oak tree off to the side of the house, tire swing optional. Timeless in a way, like it would fit in any country's history and photographs book. It's probably the same location in every plat map in the county. That's the house that Ani brings me to. Except instead of an oak tree, there is a sweat lodge. It's a big dome about the size of one storage unit and covered in a pale tan canvas. Nearby is a small flickering fire pit surrounded by rocks. Ani parks next to the owner's station wagon and I park behind it in case he wants to leave before me. We both step outside and wait. 
I expect the guy to walk out of the sweat lodge wearing all buckskin, but instead he walks out the front door in flannel and jeans. It's hard not to react to the sight. This guy's like an Indian Grim Reaper. His skin is coarse, dark brown with liver spots like a loaf of raisin bread. Tufts of white hair hang out from a navy baseball cap like outturned pockets. He smiles, but the few teeth he has left are toffee brown and do nothing to improve the unsettling look. The eyes are the worst. Clearly bloodshot, but the whites are more like yellows and only visible at the, edge of his, the edges of his giant irises. They look like they dried out years ago, and he covered them in layers of clear nail, po nail polish to hold them in. If I met this man anywhere else, I would assume my time had come. Anin Nujis. His voice is as friendly as any Indian grandpa's. I'll leave you to it. Ani shakes the man's hand and walks inside. I assume he's going to fall asleep or watch the ball game. This old man approaches me slowly, a regular walk that doesn't hold any sign of age. I expect him to offer a handshake, but he waits. Oh, right, um, here you go. I hand him a big bag of cherry scented tobacco that Ani had at his house. My stepfather told me to, a phrase to say in Ojibwe, but I'll, I'll be honest, I completely spaced it out. That's okay, Nujis. He told me a little about why you're here. The man pulls out a phone from his pocket and reads a text message. It's a smartphone, even more technologically advanced than Ani's. I didn't catch your name, sir. Ask me then. What's your name? In Ojibwe. Try Anin Ejnakazoyan. Oh, yeah, sorry. Anin Ejnakazoyan. My colonial name is Kerry. Atage Indijnakaz. Okay. My Ojibwe may be rusty, but I believe he said Atage is my traditional name. No use wasting time, he says as he takes off his hat and starts to undo the buttons on his flannel. Young Anakwad tells me you have some mudgy money do following you. I suppose a guy that looks like Carrie could call anyone young. Yeah, a ghost or a zombie, something like that. Carrie starts to laugh and fully remove his shirt. Children always have the biggest imaginations. Ghosts aren't real, Nujis. That's white people shit. What you've seen is a money do. Um, you're not understanding, he says. Or, you're, you're not undressing, he says. I hope you're not uncomfortable. The young bucks today all seem to live inside their clothes like turtles. I pull off my shirt without hesitation. Trust me, I have no problem taking off my clothes in front of men. I stand there naked as he carefully places a basket of hot rocks inside the sweat lodge next to a small fire in the center. He gestures for me to join just as he pours water over the rocks from a faded ice cream bucket. The steam fills the dim enclosure and instantly my skin is slick and warm, like a humid summer night washing over me all at once, except there's no tent, river, or ex-boyfriend. Carrie sits with his legs spread as if advertising, but I know attraction when I see it, and this is not it. This is just a man of another time, no shame or fear of his own parts. I sit with my legs crossed. Not out of shame, but because the floor of the sweat lodge is just old pine boughs that become soft and muddy as the, as the steam slicks every inch it can waft into. I'll begin with a prayer. Carrie begins an uh, in invocation in Ojibwe and sprinkles tobacco over the fire in a rhythm with his vocal emphasis. His eyes close, but I just sit there and wait. The heat inside the lodge is building and I can feel my own sweat joining the mist like a sauna after a night in a hot tub. Have you ever sit and sat and listened to nature? Carrie asks. No. Do you pray? No. Do you prefer white men or Indian men in your bed? Um, that's a little private, isn't it? We're naked. Even so, why does that matter? Might explain why you think so much like a white man. He laughs. No Ojibwe name, no prayers. I can feel it in your energy. You don't respect me or this ceremony. I shrug. You got me there. Why? I don't know. I guess maybe I'd like to know a little bit about your qualifications. Do you have a degree in medicine? Even better, I'm a card-carrying member of the Board of Shamans, BS for short. Carrie pulls out a card from a bison skin wallet. Proof. This is a strip of birch bark. I turn it over. And you drew a cock on it. You have what white, what white folks call a lack of faith, Carrie laughs. You're going to need to trust me. What do Indians call a lack of faith? Being white. Carrie begins to rattle on for what I think is about 15 minutes. I can't really tell because the heat of the lodge is finally getting to me. My breathing is hot and dry, like I'm sitting inside the onset of a fever. 
I feel my eyes closing, but I make myself sit up straight and listen to his spiel. Our people knew that every living thing has a spirit. And when the white men in lab coats looked in their microscopes, they found out humans and animals and plants all share the same kind of stuff in their bodies. Atoms and carbons are what we called spirit. So you see, Indians knew the truth of the, about the world before any white scientist. That all sounds fascinating, but I don't feel too good. You're opening up your mind. He raises his arms and looks toward the ceiling. Let the spirits take you away. I need a drink. Do you have any soda? Tough it out, kid. Be a real Indian. Oh, get you da. I know it when I see it, we was ain't. You're a warrior, like me. You don't look like a warrior. You look like a dried potato. Did I say that out loud? I really can't tell anymore. The heat is too intense. The old man stared right into my steam-cooked eyes and sat forward. Do you want to know the finest act of my life? My defining moment as an Ojibwe warrior? I guess. I blew up Mount Rushmore. I laugh and the dryness of my mouth causes it to spurt out like a broken squeak toy. What? I defaced that ugly rock forever. Would you like me would you like to hear that story before we talk about your name? I got nowhere else to be. I feel my head and shoulders rock back and forth. This feeling, it's not all that different from being baked out of my fucking mind. A ringing starts inside my ears, like I can feel the shape of the canals and the eardrums pulsing with the steam. And then the only thing I can hear is Carrie's voice. I looked up at those faces and thought, fuck, these white rats are ugly. Great white father. Good thing us apples fell far from the tree. I was with AIM back then. The American Indian movement? Yes, Glee was ain'ts. I knew all those guys, but I had to prove myself because I had just recently come back from Nam. That's where I learned how to make bombs. What kind of bomb did you make? A small one, like the size of a cherry. I thought it would be funny lighting a cherry bomb on Slave Master Washington's cunt face. Anyway, I had to prove myself to the honchos in charge. So I whipped up a bomb, brought it right to the tip top of the mountain and I lit it. At first I tried to run away, but when I looked back and saw the wick shrinking, I knew this was how I wanted to go out. I wanted to ride the crumbles of these white rats all the way down until I was crushed to death. I'd be a hero for ages. But you didn't do it. Of course I did, Guibazains. I just survived and then ran away before the park rangers could arrest me. That's a neat story, except for the part where Mount Rushmore is still there, but you know, a good story. Carrie's eyes bore into mine with cherry red lines on the yellowing whites. So you've been there? You've been to Mount Rushmore and know it's there? No, but then how do you know it's there? Because, I mean, it's not exactly something you hide. I don't buy into conspiracy theories. Ah, so that's what you're taking from this. You can only trust what you see with your own eyes. I don't feel good. You sure you don't have like a Sprite or even a Heineken in here? Tell me what you saw. Again, tell me what you saw. I try to speak, but my throat is burning and the headache has spread up across my forehead and through my eyes. I saw a dog and it came back to life from underneath some playground equipment. And it led me to Caden Kellier's grave. Why? I don't know. Why, he shouts. I don't fucking know, asshole. Why? His scream echoes across the sweat lodge like a cannon. And then his voice changes. His mouth moves, but it's not his voice. The dead marble glower, uh, the dead marble eyes glower like a spinning nickel. There are four worlds the Ojibwe walk in, but it is not you that is walking now. Fuzzy orange lights overtake my eyes and I run out of the sweat lodge. My tongue tastes the sour green grass before my lungs begin to heave and I throw up a rancid mix of bile and coffee. After a few minutes of suffering, I feel a jet of moisture across my face. Above me, the medicine man is holding a garden hose and spraying it right into my face. You need to sweat more, like a real Indian. I snatch the hose from him and inhale as much as I can without drowning myself. Thank you. Hooray! Thank you so much, Dennis. That was wonderful. All right, our last reader is Kaya Shante Wilson. Kai, would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Kaya Shante Wilson and I attended Clarion in 2010. And I think it was 10 years ago 
um, this very day that Shweta um, welcomed me um, to Clary with the rest of my class. So that's kind of a coincidence. Um, what I can say about the experience is, I, I'm not sure that Clarion teaches you to write. I don't think that that's what it's for, but for me, I acquired the confidence that I needed to become a writer. Um, you go there with a group of people, 15 or 16 folks, and over a period of weeks, you realize, you know, if, if these folks can do it, I can do it, you know? And it's, um, and there's really, <laughs> that's, that's the most profound part of Clarion to me. Um, I mean, I learned some business stuff too. I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know where you sent a short story or any of that. So it was very helpful for me to go to Clarion for that reason. And at the time I got into Clarion, I was very sick. Um, I was living in a homeless shelter and there was like no way that I was gonna be able to go unless I got a scholarship. So um, Clarion made all that possible and Octavia Butler scholarship in particular <laughs> made it possible for me to go. Um, so I had to be here today for that reason, um, just out of gratitude. And to be totally honest, I'm, I'm living in New York right now and I'm in one of those places where the demonstrations are happening, where the fireworks are going going off all day, all night long. And I haven't really been out of the apartment for a long time. And this is, um, you know, this is challenging for me, just speaking out loud, because I talk out loud maybe once a week, you know, when I call my parents and see how they're doing. Um, and I'm also in the middle of working on a novel. Um, it's done, actually, but, um, and you'll find out, um, those of you who are aspiring writers, that you're not done with a novel when you're done with a novel. That's like just one stage along the whole process. And I'm in the middle of what they call the structural edit, where your editor tells you everything you did wrong and you have to fix it. Um, that's, that's a big challenge, especially with everything going on as it is right now. Um, I wanted to read some of this to you, but... Um, I don't think I'm up to reading it, guys. You know, I don't feel like the feel like the work is right in the place where it needs to be read out loud. Um, and I feel like um, I want to tell people who like come out to see me um, and wonder what I'm working on because I feel like there are probably some folks like that that I'm definitely writing and there's definitely a book done and in draft and it's moving on to the next stage. And those of you who would like to see something new right away, um, there's a sequel that I wrote to A Taste of Honey, which not many people have, um, have read. And it's online right now. You can go to tor.com and type in glimpse of A Taste of Honey and you'll be able to read um, a sequel to that book if you're interested. Um, and I would like to answer a couple of questions if anybody who's watching this now has questions, but I think that's about everything that I have to say. I want to thank everyone for welcoming me to this. Thank awesome. You. Well, we're happy to have you. Um, so I'm going to switch it so that we can view everybody all at once. Um, and while we're waiting for questions uh, to come in, either for Kai or, or anyone else, um, I just wanted to say uh, especially thinking about um, what Kai was saying about, you know, the scholarship making it possible to attend Clarion. Um, I went to Clarion West in 2003. And when I applied, I had no idea how I was going to pay for it because I had just left my job. I had been living in New York and I left New York. Um, there were a variety of reasons, but one of them was a, a health thing. And I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to pay for this, but I got to, I got to try. Um, and so I got in and uh, I let the Clarion West folks know, I had no idea how I'm going to pay for this, but I knew that there was some financial aid available. And uh, since this was 2003, this was before the Butler scholarship. And 
a few days after I had the first conversation with um, one of the admins, I believe I talked to Neil, I got a call back from her saying that some, a person had donated my entire tuition so that I could go. So it wasn't like an existing scholarship. It wasn't, you know, cobbled together. A person believed in me and they were like, I will pay for, for her to go to Clarion West. And that person is anonymous to me. I was never told who that was, but I have always been super grateful to that person. And that's why I got involved in raising money for the scholarship. And that's why I got involved with the Carl Brandon Society so that I could help continue the scholarship because that was so important to me. And the, the, the belief that someone had in me to give me that opportunity it, it meant so much. And so that is why I continue to fundraise and I continue to support all the other people who were given that opportunity because it's just, it's just so important, um, especially as a person of color, to know that somebody believed in me that much that they gave several thousand dollars <laughs> to an organization so that I could go. All right, so I don't know that we have any questions yet. I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, so I guess I'll start by asking a question, and that is about um, writing community. Uh, since several of you have spoken about this, um, does anybody want to talk more about the kind of community that they have found to be like the most supportive, the most inspirational, um, either with their Clarion uh, cohort or after Clarion, uh, sort of in the wider science fiction and fantasy community? See, everybody is shy. <laughs> For me, it's kind of a mix. Um, I've there are a couple of people that I still keep in touch with from my Clarion West class who are immensely supportive and thoughtful, and who um, essentially keep in touch with me, give me pushes when I feel like I'm not good enough, um, give let me know about opportunities that come up. Um, but there's also really generous writers that I've met outside of that. There's um, people I've met online. There is a Twitter group that um, is probably in the audience that um, is just a big group chat of uh, young black writers and aspiring writers, and they're all really wonderful and supportive people. Um, there's the community that works at and um, works around FIA, which is a black focused um, speculative fiction magazine. And they've all been really great. And obviously there's the people I have met through Clarion West um, who weren't necessarily in my same class. Um, Nisi Shaw, who is watching right now, um, has been really supportive. And um, yeah, so it's not just the people that you meet there. Um, there's been plenty of other opportunities and it isn't necessary to go to Clarion or Clarion West to meet these people, but those are some of the people that have been uh, my support group. I really appreciated um, having encouragement um, from some of my cohorts early on. Uh, I no longer am in, in touch with them in that way, but in the first years, it made a real difference to get that nudge and encouragement. Um, and I was so ambitious to write professionally that I actually went out and hired editors after Clarion to, to read drafts of my stuff. I just wanted people to dig in there and tear my stuff apart with a professional eye. Um, and I still do that. I mean, to this day, although I have like a, a professional editor, I still you know, try to get another eye on my book and I'll pay people for that because for me, that's really important. And I want that kind of feedback. And I really love what friends do for you. Friends are great, but friends don't necessarily <laughs> tear your manuscript apart line by line. You know? um, and that's something that I appreciate. So. Dennis, did you want to say anything? Yeah, um, see uh, Nisi's question there. Um, what, what I'm remembering is when I was uh, doing writing on my own, uh, own time, just before I uh, really started my undergraduate degree, what inspired me a lot, maybe more than anything, was getting a detailed rejection letter from Tor.com. 
Uh, I had, I'd sent stories here and there, but th it, that was the first time I got a rejection letter that told me, um, you know, this is what we like, there's merit here, and we, w we really want you to send more. This one wasn't quite right, but it was almost right. And just, just seeing something that wasn't a form letter was, you know, enough for, enough for me to get a, an extra kick and just keep going with it um, and bold of a motivation. And um, every now and then I, I will still go through some of those, uh, not just um, uh, not just out of like a fond memory, but uh, just to see specifically if I'm if I'm redrafting this story or that, what what these specific problems were, or maybe not problems, maybe that's too negative, but you know, just little observations that could help just either improve your one story or it could improve all of your writing. And um, having that kind of uh, fondness for Tor.com, it uh, introduced me to a lot of different short stories. I, I remember reading The Water That Falls on You From Nowhere by John Chu, um, and then seeing that it won an award. And that was kind of, um, and th then clicking on that award, seeing all the recipients for the past few years, and then uh, I believe it was the Hugo Award, and then um, just finding more short stories to delve into. And from there, I think that's how I specifically found Clarion was just a lot of um, clicking on different authors and seeing their bios and seeing where they went. And I grew really interested in from there. Well, thank you. And uh, just for the record, since nobody else can see the chat but us, um, Nisi had asked, what gave each of you the idea you were good enough to apply to Clarion West or Clarion? Uh, anybody else want to tackle that one? Yeah, I actually want to say that uh, that that I had a very similar experience to Dennis, which was a detailed rejection for a story from Strange Horizons, and like Strange Horizons has been my tour.com in that in that regard. Like they really got me thinking that like I can do this and I'm going to try. Um, also, the steering committee for Clarion in 2007, sorry, the, uh, the anchor group, the, the two instructors at the end, well, what are they called? Anyway, it was, it was Delia Sherman and Ellen Kushner. And um, I was a fan already. And uh, my graduate school advisor was an old friend of theirs. And she also, she's probably in the chat right now. Hi, Eve. Uh, she's she really encouraged me to keep going and uh, and you know put my stories in front of their eyes to to see if I would get in. It, it was it was some community support and a whole bunch of stuff from from editors who thought I would be worth the while. Thank you. Uh, anyone else, or I can move on to the next question. I can do mine quickly. Um, yeah. I have a weird mixture of incredible insecurity and also overweening arrogance. So I read about the workshop and I decided that I wanted to go. And I didn't look to see, well, what kind of people go and how hard is it to get in? And I just decided I wanted to go, looked at the application process and applied. And I was lucky, I got in on my first time and I got there and I found people who'd been applied two, three times before they got in. And I found out that it was harder than I thought. But I think in a lot of cases, it's really served me well enough to have the kind of blind arrogance that, well, somebody else has done it, why can't I? And that's just where mine came from. I feel like more people should have that kind of confidence. Uh, all right, so we have a question that says, how do y'all go about creating such powerful dialogue? In everything I've read from each panelist, the dialogue is striking and compact. Are there any specific ways y'all make that happen? Um, I'll, I'll start that one. Um, I always thought that I was horrible at dialogue and I was trying to write my first novel and I was like, how are you gonna do this? You gotta put dialogue in it. And I realized that I had these voices in the back of my head of just people who were talking. Like, because I thought of dialogue, it's like, all right, let's make this happen. I got my pen, I got my paper, let's write dialogue. 
And then I realized that I could actually hear people like in my head. Like I would say, what would characters like this talk about in a situation like this? And a reel would start in my head and I would hear voices. And when I got stuck with the dialogue, I would just start listening to those voices and jotting down what they said. And it didn't feel like I personally was doing the dialogue. So if someone feels like they're having a hard time with dialogue, I would say stop making so much effort and just like imagine what would people be saying in such a situation? Like just naturally, what would people be talking about? That was a real breakthrough for me. I, I guess for me, the, can I answer? Yes, right. please go. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess for me, yeah, the, um, what pushes a lot of my dialogue is wanting broken up pacing. Because after a while, when, when I really get into writing, if I start seeing that I'm, I'm just too many paragraphs, um, unless that's specifically what I'm going for, um, but usually in fiction, uh, you don't want too many of those big paragraphs. So I, I make myself split it up. And most of the time when I start out doing that, my, I feel like there's nothing I'm worse at than dialogue. Um, uh, but those kind of voices, those, you know, the neuroses, the you're not good at this, you hate that. I'm, I'm picking this apart as I write, I'm just going crazy. But put those voices in, um, like use that kind of, use your, um, use your own voice that's in the back of your head, your your cynicism, your humor. You just try and grow that onto the page uh, from you know, very easy placeholder dialogue. Just um, at first, I, I I do what what's necessary. And uh, looking back, like right now, um, on one of these stories I, um, that I'm working on now, I every single line of dialogue in there right now is probably going to be stricken and rewritten because I I hate them as they are right now. <laughs> Um, but they do need to be there and you need to find, you need to find ways to make your character's voices unique. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, grow it as slower, as quick as you can, but just, just make sure as you're adding to it, um, it's, uh, maybe it's kind of a fine balance between just sounding like your own voice, but also characterizing each one of your own kind of critiques. Um, and just trying to create a, for me, it's easier with comical situations because then, uh, then you can, then you can capture all the awkwardness, all of the, all the cynicism, all of the weirdness that people in conversations actually go through. They interrupt each other. They, um, say the wrong thing at the wrong time, or they'll say the right thing, but maybe three other friends are talking and you just kind of feel like, oh, but I had something to say. Just, just, just throw it all out there, I guess, um, and just really edit as you go, and just push through that instinct to not write dialogue or that the fear of it. Awesome. Anyone else want to hop in on that? I'd like to. Okay. I. Oh, 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 Shreddy, you go you first. Go. <laughs> Which one of those? Okay. Shreddy, you um, go first. So. In some ways, I'm kind of the exact opposite of Dennis. Like the characters in my head do not shut up. They they want my stories to be hundreds of pages of just them sitting around talking. My problem is making them actually do anything besides blathering. And but but at the same time, I have the same thing. Like like my early draft, I my early drafts, I end up changing every line of conversation afterwards because because they ramble to start. But the other part of how I do dialogue is I run role-playing games and there is no, more, no better training for coming up with dialogue quick than that. So that's me. So, in my life, yeah. Um, so for me, um, when I'm writing on dialogue, um, it's really an outgrowth of character. Now, I don't tend to think of characters as real people. They're kind of paper dolls to me, um, but I want them to look like real people. So I want them to be dressed up in the finery that makes them look like people. So their conversations are an outgrowth of what I think makes them 
look like what they're supposed to look like. So if I have, for instance, somebody who is haughty and uh, rude, then their language would kind of express their upbringing and their background. And if I have somebody who's clumsy and awkward, then they would have halting speech. They would drop things um, in the middle of speech. They would use the wrong words comically. Um, if I have somebody who is kind of seen as low class, but is trying to um, you know, socially climb, then their language would be very precise and careful. Um, and then once I've done that, um, obviously, when it, in the first draft, it comes out kind of stilted because this is all me trying to dress it up. I kind of polish it up. I strip out words. I add extra ones. I read it aloud a lot and I make voices. Um, I did that a little bit in the reading, but not nearly as much as I do in the revision process where I have each character uh, talk in their different voice and I, I hear how it sounds. Um, and... Then, because dialogue is also an illusion, I try to make sure that it doesn't sound too much like real people, because real people have a lot of uhs and ums and boring asides, like I'm doing now, um, that don't necessarily work in a story. So I strip those out until it's kind of what I think of as a polished essence. And then I go over it again and see if it still shines. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you all. Uh, we have another question. This is for everyone, although I suspect some of you have already answered this. Um, what short story or novel had the most impact on your wanting to write and why? And anybody can jump in. I'll jump in. Okay. Uh, so right around, I think, 19, I was uh um, working at a casino and working late night shifts, uh, midnight to 8 a.m. And so what I would do is buy sets of books and just try and read a bunch of them. Uh, I would buy them from Walmart and Target and just the, you know, compact. Uh, they come in like either a box set or maybe just plastic wrap. But I love doing that and delving into new authors and new series. Um, and if I really enjoy it, then I'll move on to that author's other stuff. So for me, um, I just randomly picked up um, A Song of Ice and Fire and I got maybe two, three books in and I said, oh, this is pretty good. I, I think I wanna look at some of his other stuff. Had no idea um, what George's actual work was. And so I was flipping through my Amazon Kindle app on my phone. I, I think this is around the time I first got a smartphone. So I was you know, messing around on that and I downloaded his novella, A Song for Laia. Uh, with absolutely no idea what to expect. Um, and for me, the reason this one was so impactful is because I think I began it with a more um, like, oh, it's sci-fi and, and it's a romance. That's that's kind of cute. That's okay. Um, I didn't, I didn't have, at first it didn't bring much of an impression, but as it builds, um, you, uh, you, you stay with these two characters, Rob and Laia, and um, to me, I just grew really invested in their romance. So by the time it got to the emotional climax of that story, I, I was actually like kind of shaking in a way, um, maybe, I guess more internal shaking, but I'm like, no, Laya, what are you doing? That's, it was a, it was a very personal thing when I was reading. like this, this isn't how the story ends. Come on, that's it. But ever since then, I've, I've just, I've loved how that story unfolds and, where it goes and how kind of dissatisfied I was, but in a good way, if that makes sense. It just, it, it had the right emotional climax for me. And um, ever since then, I uh, I guess, in the, in the years after that, I, I was thinking, I wanna write that kind of story. I want to have this moment where the audience is kind of floored away in, in both like an emotional way and just a, wow, that was a really good story way. Shweta? I'll go next. Uh, I was going to say, I actually have no idea just because I, I would read absolutely anything that came in front of me, especially as a kid. But, but I think the thing that made me realize that writing was a thing that a real person could do rather than those, those like semi-divine names on the covers of books was... Um, Le Guin's book of essays, The Language of the Night. It's a really old one. And, and some of the essays don't age that well, but 
the the depth with which she talks about just writing in that is like, whoa, this is a thing that real people can do. And then I basically didn't stop. Hooray for that. I'll, I'll, answer, it. I'll answer too. Um, when I was a child, uh, my mother used to take us to church every Sunday and we were there all day. We would come early, early in the morning for Sunday school and be there until the afternoon. And we weren't, I wasn't allowed to read anything in church um, except the Bible. So I was a child and I was reading the Bible because that was the only thing I was allowed to read um, when I was in church. And the language really struck me, but of course, I was a child, I thought it was really boring. Um, and I couldn't wait to go back home and read my cheesy science fiction and fantasy books. And I realized that the two of those things like combined in my head somehow. Like I wanted those cheesy science fiction books to have that like thunderous biblical language at the same time. So my writing had very much come from the mix of those two things. Awesome. Christopher, do you want to also continue? Um, I had some difficulty because um, I was a really voracious reader and I don't actually even remember when I first started making up stories, um, uh, the, certainly before I could write them down. Um, I, but I was always one of the little kids who was uh, playing let's pretend and coming up with adventures and imaginary things. And so I thought about it and Actually, a thing that is a kind of turning point for me is when I decided I wanted to write queer stories. And um, so that's what I'll actually answer, even though that's not really the question. Um, when I was a teenager, uh, there weren't a lot of good depictions of um, gay men in particular. And everything I looked for was kind of furtive and criminal and tragic. And um, I read Giovanni's Room by um, James Baldwin, which is tragic, but the, the men in it who are probably bisexual, but to me, like close enough to my identity to um, uh, target onto were real and their problems were real and their feelings for each other was real. And even though the story ends tragically and it doesn't end happily, it was the first time I saw people who were like me. And at this point I was deep, deep, deep in the closet uh, were given dignity and breath and space. And I wanted to write stories like that, where queer people were given dignity and breath. And so that was one of the first really big influences specifically from a work of fiction that um, kind of pushed me into the way that I write now. Thank you. All right, so we are nearing the end of our time, uh, but I, I'm telling you, we could go on like this forever because I just want to hear these people talk all the time. So uh, we're going to end uh, with uh, two things. One is me giving you once again the pitch to say, uh, first of all, thank you for those of you who contributed to the Carl Brandon Society um, when uh, you got a ticket for this event. Um, and if you have been inspired by any of the fiction or any of the stories that you heard today, uh, please do go to carlbrennan.org uh, and donate so that we can continue to support writers like these fine folks, um, the, the next people coming up. Because that is, as I said, the reason why I got involved in this organization to begin with was to support this scholarship specifically. But we also have several other programs um, that are all about supporting Black, Indigenous, people of color in this community, um, whether they're writers or they're fans. All right, so that's my pitch. And so I want to end uh, by having everybody tell the audience where you can, where they can find you, um, your website, your social media, uh, your latest thing. So we'll go in the order of reading. So Chris, why don't you start? Okay, um, I have uh, two stories at Uncanny Magazine. Um, one's in issue 33, which is If Salt Lose Its Savor. Um, and one's in issue 22, I'm 28. I'm really bad at issues today, um, which is Can't Sell Draw Out the Leviathan, which I read an excerpt of. Uh, there's also a story at um, Strange Horizons, which was in the um, uh, Southeast America, um, um, not Southeast, was it Southeast America? Um, Southeast America edition edited by um, Cherie Thomas. 
and um, I tweet at uh, Seraph76, and um, I need to update my website, so I won't mention it. Okay, Shweta. Okay, time for me to be embarrassed. My website is hideously out of date. It will tell you the really new things that are happening in like 2010. Um, and I've kind of fallen off the face of the planet from social media because I realized that being on Tumblr had me constantly triggered and that added to the brain fog. So uh, if, you, if you do a Google search for Shwetan Orion, you will find this amazing environmentalist in, in India named Shweta Narayan, who, and you will not find me, but if you search on Shweta Narayan fiction, you will. I've got stuff at Lightspeed Magazine, Strange Horizons, I've got a poem at Tor.com. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I will work on that at some point. Thanks, uh, Dennis. So right at the moment, uh, I don't have a author website. Um, it's it's on my procrastination list. Uh, I'll I'll get to it eventually. But for now, I'm on um, I'm on Facebook. I have both my own page. I'm not really shy about adding just about anyone who wants to be friends with just my own page. But I also have an author page for anyone who wants just the fiction updates instead of you know crazy memes and the Facebook feed nonsense we all know. Um, no longer on Twitter, but I, um, I hope to be starting a blog on, uh, um, on that procrastination website whenever I get to it. Uh, I currently have a story in Nightmare Magazine um, called uh, uh, The One You Feed and one in Asimov Science Fiction called The Fourth Hill, both very based in northern Minnesota Ojibwe culture. Uh, and uh, I hope to be in more magazines sometime this year and publish more in the future. And then just earlier this year in March, my, my first novel came out, uh, This Town Sleeps. So um, you can pick that up at counterpointpress.com uh, or whatever uh, book sites or stores you choose to go to. Awesome. Hi. I read his novel and it's good, everybody. You should read it. I can Thank most you. easily be found at Tor.com. And if you want to see some of my other fiction, if you just put my full name into Amazon, um, you can get a list of things there. You don't have to buy it from Amazon. You can just look for me there. Um, I'm not on social media, so <laughs> you can read my fiction. Listen, if I could give up Twitter, I would. I envy all of you who are just like, yeet. All right. Thank you all for, uh, for sharing with us today. I really appreciate it. I also just really enjoy seeing all your faces and uh, I love all your fiction. And I'm just really glad that you were all part of this community. You make this community better. And so thank you so much. Um, for just being here and thank all the people who came to watch and all the people who are going to watch this later um, and yeah from the Carl Brown Society my heart is full because of you guys so yay thanks a lot awesome